Today we're talking about the science behind the 2022 Tonga eruption. Tonga is 2,000 kilometres north of New Zealand. The volcano that erupted is known as Hunga Tonga Hunga Haiapai. The islands of Tonga sit alongside the Tonga Trench, which is the second deepest body of water on Earth, reaching over 10 kilometres in depth. The outermost layer of the Earth is made up of rigid tectonic plates. The Australian plate is moving to the north at 5 centimetres a year, that's about the same speed that your fingernails grow at, while the Pacific plate is moving to the west, towards the Australian plate. The eastern margin of the Australian plate started to split apart about 5 million years ago, producing the Tonga Kermadec Arc microplate. If we were to slice through those plates where the red box is shown, it would produce the following cross section. The cross section shows the Australian plate on the left and the Pacific plate on the right. The splitting of the Australian plate has created a space which is being filled by the mantle from below. As the mantle cools, it forms a warm, buoyant crust. The Pacific plate is old, so it has lots of time to cool down. So when it bangs into the new plate, it sinks in a process known as subduction. The Tonga Trench occurs directly above where these two plates meet. The Pacific plate subducts at 24 centimetres every year. As it gets deeper, water and other volatiles are given off. This rises through the asthenosphere until it reaches the mantle where it causes partial melting. These melts rise as magma towards the surface where they cause volcanic eruptions. If you remove the water from around the Tongan Islands, you would see a line of volcanic features along its western margin, including the Honga Tonga Honga Haiapai volcano that erupted. The magma is at 1000 degrees Celsius, so if it comes in contact with seawater, it causes that water to evaporate to steam explosively. This is what happened on January 15th, and it caused the largest volcanic eruption we've seen so far this century. The explosive expansion to steam caused a massive shockwave which was visible from space, heard in Tonga, in Fiji, and in parts of Queensland and Alaska. The shockwave was recorded as pressure changes at weather stations throughout the world, including at Brisbane, Darwin, and Kalgoorlie. Notice how the further the station is from Tonga, the later in the day the pressure wave arrived. The sea height gauge in the capital of Tonga records the daily movement of the tides. On January 14th, it recorded 10 centimetre high tsunami waves from the minor eruptions, and on January 15th, it recorded a 2 metre high wave from the main eruption before it stopped transmitting data. A tsunami is a thick ocean wave. By thick, I mean that the distance from the trough to the peak to the following trough is very long, so it can take several minutes for one of these waves to pass by. Rather than behaving like a breaking wave, instead they behave more like a rising tide. Tsunamis are frequently only a few centimetres tall out on the open ocean because they spread over large distances, but when the waves approach shallow seas, the seafloor drags in the wave, slowing it down, causing it to pile up on itself, leading to large wave heights. The tsunami reached heights of 15 metres on some Tongan islands, including at Atata Island, where the waves destroyed over 70 buildings. Fortunately, the noise of the eruption gave locals enough time to move to higher ground. The tsunami radiated out from Tonga. It was recorded in Fiji, in Norfolk Island, on the Gold Coast, in Tasmania and WA. Passing through the narrow Torres Strait reduced its height at Groot Island. The Tiwi Islands reduced it further, so the wave was too small to be recorded in Darwin. The tsunami was recorded elsewhere in the Pacific. It was recorded as 1 metre waves in Japan and in North America. 2 metre high waves caused damage in South America. The tsunami passed around South America and up through the Atlantic Ocean, with small waves detected in Norway 35 hours after the eruption. Back in Tonga, the explosive nature of the eruption shattered the rock and lava into trillions of tiny fragments called ash. The force of the eruption and the rising steam caused the ash to rise high into the atmosphere. The central ash column of the main eruption reached 58 kilometres high before collapsing back into the stratosphere where it expanded out to be 400 kilometres wide. If placed over Australia, it would have been tall enough to be visible from most of the Northern Territory. Some of the ash fell on the Tongan Islands, coating the ground, plants and buildings in a layer of ash. When magnified, you can see that the ash is full of tiny bubbles. This makes it light so it can stay in the air longer before falling down. It also makes it abrasive. It can damage aeroplane engines, 
so pilots now avoid flying through ash clouds. After the main eruption, flights detoured either side of the ash cloud. The ash cloud was tracked by the Darwin Volcanic Ash Advisory Centre to help pilots avoid flying through it. The Copernicus satellite can detect sulphur dioxide in the atmosphere. It occurs in pollution and in volcanic eruptions. The sulphur dioxide from the Tongan eruption is visible on the edges of this map, as is emissions from other erupting volcanoes. The sulphur dioxide and the ash travel with the wind westward over Australia, where it caused spectacular sunsets before continuing on to Africa. The Tongan eruption has caused many changes to the environment in Tonga and away from Tonga. The impact of these changes will continue for several months. For example, pumice rafts are likely to wash up on Australia's east coast in a few months. Please subscribe to see more Earth Science videos.